อนะโมทัสสะบะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะบะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะบุทังธัมมังสังฆังนามัสส
Now by letting go, I'm not saying throwing away. Because throwing away means also aversion, doesn't it? Get out of here. You throw things away you don't want. Or you're frightened of. You don't know what to do with. There's always, uh, that's an act of self, isn't it? This I don't want, I'm going to get rid of it. But letting go is, is nothing much at all. Like this, say, his fist, this tight, grasping fist. It's really grasping hold of things like that. And throwing away is like that, get out of here. That movement. And grasping is, come here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and throwing away is, get out of here. Now between those is just this. Now that doesn't look like much, does it? It's not this, nor is it that. This is ordinary. But say, it's relaxed. Not grasping, nor is it rejecting. Well, apply that to the mind. Get out of here. Come here. I want this. I don't want that. Now, if you now just to say the relaxed position is to just observe that as a changing condition. Because if you start thinking, I shouldn't have desires to get rid of. I shouldn't have desires to grasp. You may complicate and getting terribly complicated. I've got to do something about this grasping. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get rid of this grasping, and you just don't know what you do. <laughs> it's not a matter of getting rid of or of uh, getting more of but of observing. If, when I say it, it's an inner peace, a, re, a, a relaxation of the heart, maybe. It's like a sigh. <sighs> Just being at ease with things. But before it was, what should I do next? What should I do next? What? I've got so many faults. I, I'll never, never get enlightened in the next 10,000 lifetimes. I'm so bad. And, I've got to, let's see, I've got to do this and do that and then do this and then do that and then everything's going crazy, isn't it? And then you, and you think, I can't, I know I'll never be able to do it. So you go take some kind of sleeping pill, zonk. But it, that's why there's this inner listening, this listen to it. The, have, have, develop that gentleness of metta. Like when you go home, practice that. Try, try really developing that in, in your layman's life, in your work, with, your, with yourself mainly. If you can do it with yourself, you'll be able to do it for others. Just this gentleness, kindness. Even, you know, no matter how awful, what a really wretched, miserable person you are, <laughs> have metta for it, because it's not really you, you, see, you just think it is. Just have this kind of peacefulness with it. Peaceful coexistence. You think, well, I've got these terrible weaknesses and problems and I should do something. You think I'm just going to have to spend the rest of my life just having metta for this miserable being, me? <laughs> You think it's permanent? You think you're permanently a miserable wretch? No, if you you know, the miserable wretches come and go, just like everything else. They're not any, there's nothing permanent about them at all. So, if you have this metta, this gentleness, and patience, and uh, peacefulness with these conditions, you'll You'll be able to see miserable wretches are quite all right. They come, they go. You get, sometimes there's crossness, grumpiness, selfishness, pride, conceit, jealousy, envy, anger and hatred and greed, lust, the whole doubt and fear, the whole gamut of miserable conditions will come and go. 
But that's all right. You're not, you're not asking you to, to, uh, to build a fence around yourself and, and refuse to let anything come and go. But to watch the comings and goings, that which comes and goes is not you, is not yours. Now, in a listening also, when you listen to the conditions of the mind, you begin to hear the, the mind itself, the silence of the mind. You have to listen beyond the conditions that rise and pass away. Listen to the inner silence. Now, when you can hear that inner silence, then, it, then conditions come and go in that silence. You can actually concentrate on inner silence. If you're trying to think about it, then that's another condition. But just this bare attention will allow to hear some, uh, a, a kind of sound or silence that is not something that, that doesn't arise or pass away. It's like space in this room here. We're attached to the thing. We don't space. We don't notice. Oh, look at the curtains, look at the walls, look at the shrine, look at the monks, look at the meditators. We can spend our time here just looking at the things in this room, thinking, how could we improve it, make it more beautiful, or whatever. Trying to create the perfect meditation hall. You can fascinate, or look at the people, and think, wonder what he's like, wonder what she's like, look at him, why is he smiling like that, look at her, why is she frowning like that, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> get com completely caught up in the conditions of the room here. So, the, But the most important thing that makes this room livable so that we can all fit in it is the space. If there wasn't any space in this room, we couldn't be here, could we? This was a solid room, solid with no space in it. It would not serve our purposes as a shrine room anymore. It'd be a block. Now the space is contained with form, like the walls of this room contain the space. So that you don't have to. You don't have infinite space. You have a contained space. It kind of protects you. But the space is, is the most important thing in this room, as far as the room goes. The rest isn't all that necessary. But it's the thing we would least notice, because it doesn't have any particular characteristic. Not red space, blue space, not interesting space, it's not boring space, it's not important space or unimportant space. It's not female space or male space. It's just space. The space around you and the space around me is just the space. You can't say there's a tomato space there and a venerable sujito space over there. Doesn't make sense, does it? Space is we can all fit into this space. There's room for us all. In the mind, there's space, a silence or space, an emptiness that we never notice because we're so caught up with the uh, conditions. Look at the drapes. Look at the carpet. Look at him. Look at her. Look at this. And we go on. We keep becoming fa fascinated or averse to the qualities that come and go, red, yellow, blue, green, orange, pink, purple, jumping for joy, falling down in despair and weeping, jumping for joy, falling down in despair and weeping. <laughs> now when you take refuge in the space of your mind, then, then, there's, then the meditation is very easy. There's nothing you have to do it, just let everything dissolve into space, because everything that arises will pass away into that emptiness. 
not definite. There's nothing that will, anything that arises will not stay. It will arise and pass. Now when, then you have a perspective that you don't have when you're, you see, it's hard for you to understand this because you're still very much identified with the conditions of the mind itself, your habitual ways of your thinking, your attitudes, all are based on the idea of being, becoming, uh, of being this or being that. So that's why in this uh, vipassana practice, you're you're not annihilating conditions. You're not saying uh, we're not getting rid of conditions, but we're we're looking at them in a different way. So we have a perspective on them, like an artist looking at uh, looking at the space, becoming more aware of the of a perspective rather than just absorbing into a condition. It, and it's out of perspective, being obsessed with one condition and lose the perspective on it, thinking that it's the ultimate reality or the real. Now Buddhism, Buddhist teaching makes a very clear, makes it very clear what is conventional reality and what is ultimate reality. It's probably the most clear presentation of any known religion of the present time. Because this is where religion gets, um, seems to get lost, is not having any, not knowing what is convention and what is conventional reality and what is ultimate reality. So, so many people get trapped into the conventions, conventional realities, like the religion, uh, the form of religion itself, is thinking that that's the ultimate reality. Thinking that a belief in God is the ultimate reality. Thinking that doing all these rituals and rites and precepts and all that is ultimate reality. Regarding that is real in itself, rather than conven- just a convention. But ultimate reality doesn't have a form. You can't say it's this or that. But conventional reality is always formed. It has a beginning and an end. Whatever begins and ends is only conventional reality. We're not denying that it, we're not saying it doesn't exist. Like it's silly if I said, you just don't exist, you know. You're not really here at all. You're a delusion. Anything. That one's hard to take. I certainly feel like I exist. But we're not saying that that these bodies are illusions and that they don't really exist. We're saying the perception of it, our attachment to the perception of it, makes us see it as something other than what it really is. Now it's the attachment to the perception rather than the perception itself or the uh, body or any condition. It's the attachment. Now this way of seeing the impermanent nature of condition is a way of letting go, of uh, non-attachment. First we say letting go because our habitual our ways are always so to grasp everything. But as we are more aware, we begin to not grasp, and then we just don't, do not attach. We just let things come and go. We don't feel compelled to manipulate, control, repress, or annihilate, or <coughs> possess, because we know those, are, those themselves are just changing conditions conventional reality. So, the Buddhist monk lives in the world of conventional reality like, like you do. Ajahn Cha has to eat food, walk on arms round, go to sleep, sit, stand, walk, lie down, go to the toilet, just like any other human being. 
conventional realities are that way. But the ultimate reality is Ajahn Chah no longer attaches to any of those things, no longer deluded by the conventional realities. There's no more doubts. He no longer sees himself as being this or that or that he should become anything or should get rid of anything. So he's at ease. He's a, he's a human being, conventional little man, Thai man, a monk, Buddhist monk, 64 years old, conventional reality, but not attached. But he hasn't thrown it away either. He's not, he's not saying... He hasn't killed himself. He still can laugh and talk and and uh, and visit America. And <laughs> so it's not like he's kind of any, uh, a ghost floating through space. He just looks as physical as anyone else. But there's no non-attachment to it. No, no longer deluded by it. Now it's just that much, and if you start thinking, uh, you know, of meditation as being anything special, or that you have to do anything special, might be wise to do something special, but realize that that's only a that's only a, a thought and opinion. Don't grasp it as that, uh, you know, cling to the ideas of meditation as being special. But listen to that thing in your mind that always opinionates, has views, fears, doubts, and worries, seeing the impermanent nature of that. Conform the bodily actions and speech, as I was saying last night, to the, to the form of the moral precepts, as a householder, as a layman to the five. That's very important. If you to be um, uh, uh, have a, a good container, a good form, is necessary. See, too many people meditating without a form, and they just kind of drift around. They don't. They, you, you, know, you, you really can't get anywhere that way. Really can't. You, you know, it's just not possible. You just flit about, fooling yourself. So, establish the the bodily action and speech in the form of five precepts, eight precepts, 227 rules of the monk, whatever. In the future, I know it's hard for, for many of you who don't have to live in conditions where People don't respect that, those kind of precepts, so you just have to do the best you can, really. But keep in keep in mind that the form is a guide for action and speech. Eventually, hopefully, communities will grow up around monasteries and that, where people will be able to join in community and. Uh, that's always nice. When it's very nice to live in Dharma communities where you have su- support each other, and where your your interests in the Dhamma are shared, so that you don't have to always fight off the people who think, who get angry because you're you're being very moral. <laughs> Well, he's about fighting people. <laughs> but you have to, as I was saying, you have to take into account your way how you have to live and and work it out. Don't don't uh, don't be discouraged by what seem what seem, might seem impossible situation. Or this, if you do, you know, if you feel that it's impossible, just note that. Just keep aware of that. 
that can't start from where you are right now. These are suggested ways of developing skillful life. Now this, uh, this, uh, as a human being, is a form, isn't it? You have to live. This isn't a form you voluntarily chose. It's a form you, you, you find yourself in as a man or a woman, human being in this 20th century, 1981. This has a form, doesn't it? Looks like a monk, looks like a man, looks like a human being. Well, this contains, doesn't it? It's a container. It's like any other form. So this body is a, is, is a form that we have to learn how to live within this form also of, of a human being. Now the human form means you have you're stuck to the ground. You can't fly up in the air. And you, you have to suffer pain because the body's quite a painful condition and you have to get hungry and cold and, and uh, just look at the society we live in now. It's uh, people obsessed with convenience. Just these bodies are such a so heavy and so cumbersome that we have to spend uh, this technology, develop this incredible technology just to make life more less painful for us anyway. We think we're making it less painful by having all these. Uh, gadgets and make, trying to make life convenient because the body is a is a kind of clumsy condition and it gives us a lot of pain and it gets old gets sick and dies when it's dark we can't see we have to have electricity and we can switch on the light because in the dark it's rather frightening, we don't know. In, in uh, less advanced societies like Northeast Thailand where they don't have electricity, you learn to sit in the dark, which is quite peaceful actually. <laughs> when it gets dark, you just sit in the dark and meditate. Peaceful, and the dark is very peaceful. So you say in a less technologically advanced society, like in Northeast Thailand, things are much more primitive. You have to draw water from wells, don't have electricity, uh, don't have electric uh, washing machines, dryers, dishwashers, all these things don't have. Ajahn Chah wouldn't even allow the pumps, electric pumps put on the well. So the monks have to work together. We have, the well rings at three in the afternoon, we have to go out to the well and help draw water in buckets. A uh, bucket on a, on a rope, pulley. It goes down into the well, we all pull it up, kind of big can like this. And monks get on, several monks on the rope and pull it up and the other, another monk grabs the can and pours it into smaller buckets and then you, just, then you put these buckets on a bamboo pole and two monks carry these buckets of water around to the different bathing places or the kitchen to fill up the water jugs. <coughs> Quite primitive, isn't it? But it all has its advantages too in the sense that you develop a uh, you help each other in things like that. There's not the sense of, don't bother me, I'm meditating. It's a necessity of everybody has to help do the, uh, do very simple chores like that. So that uh, this is a uh, seemingly inconvenience, but it's not really. It makes life much, his life is really much easier because it's simpler. 
when you have a lot of gadgets and convenient uh, uh, convenient technology, life becomes more complex. Like find it like chitters, plumbing, then the sewers clog up, the toilets, and the, then they you have to have electric bills, telephone. You have to have uh, uh, rates and taxes and and uh, water, mains water, and it goes on. Endless kind of complexity just for some kind of what we think is convenient. So sometimes a less, uh, a, a more primitive or less technologically advanced way is, is a really more peaceful. At least I found so. Easier. But we have to take into account we live in a very technological age where technology is has gone rampant. So don't dwell in discontent on that, just live uh, in a peaceful way with it. You can certainly use electric washing machines, dryers, mains water and so electricity. But to see that it's not really necessary. If those things stop working, it's not the end of the world. You can just sit in the dark. It's very peaceful in the dark. You can. You don't need to have uh, all kinds of fancy foods and luxuries and things like this to be happy because you find out if you train your mind, if you sit in at ease with yourself, you're happy wherever you are. You can be in the middle of New York or in the middle of jungle. You can have everything or nothing and you can be content. If your mind is is good, then what, there's no there's no sorrow anymore. The dark is fine, the light is fine. Because the mind itself is, is bliss, is peace, is light. You don't need to depend upon the conventional reality of the senses anymore. If, they, if you go blind, it's quite all right. It's not going to, it's not the end of the world. Because the sensual world can easily be destroyed or harmed. The bodies can easily be damaged. You can go blind or deaf. Tongue can be cut out. You can have leprosy. You can have cancer. Internal diseases and all kinds of your legs can be cut off, arms. All kind of dreadful things can happen, but that's to the body only. The mind is all is not damaged, even if all that happens. The worst possible things happen, the mind would be all right. If you know that, if there's wisdom. So there's nothing to fear. People, just think what will happen if the technology failed. When I was living in London, I used to think, I don't want to be here in this city when it all starts falling apart. Because nobody will know what to do. And everybody will start going crazy when the underground doesn't work anymore, electric, electricity, and all the things stop functioning, and there's no more food, and really frightening, millions of people all crammed in one area together. That's really frightening to think of, of you know, you've become so dependent upon everything working, the technology going on forever, you think it's, it's kind of permanently going to be there. But when I was in London, they had well, we, the first year they used to have electricity strikes, and you, suddenly the lights would go out, and the whole city would be dark. And they had a dustman strike, dustmen or garbage men. For how long was it? A couple of months. Nobody collected the garbage in London. 
way. It's pretty bad, actually. <laughs> Now this, we think we have to have this, uh, the, all these things for our happiness. But like in the, this morning, contemplation of the four requisites, we, you really don't need very much. If you, this note here, if you, when you're really at peace with yourself, when you're calm, it's, it's just nice to just sit. It's very nice just to be, just sitting or standing, walking, lying down. You don't need anything, you don't need books or television or anything. The mind itself is so nice, so good, and so uh, perfect that it don't, you don't, the rest seems rather, uh, very unnecessary. <clears throat> you can just eat to survive, just take care of the body. You don't have to spend your life eating food, munching, escaping through m- uh, habitual munching on things, smoking cigarettes, dope, drinking, Going to show bars, looking around for something to do, because the mind In uh, after I spent one uh, vasa, one rainy season with Ajahn Chah. After that rainy season, it was about in January of the following year, I took leave of Ajahn Chah because I wanted to go meditate, do intensive practice up on a mountain. So I uh, Ajahn Chah gave me his blessing, and off I went to this place up in Sukhulnakorn province. Uh, and there I, uh, Pupek Hill, I spent six months up on this hill. I, you know, I always had this great desire to, to be a hermit, live out in the caves or out in the mountains alone. And so I uh, found Wat Bapong, I said, too, too uh, civilized here. They're, they're morning chanting, evening chanting, you have to carry water in the afternoon, and this and that. And they're interfering with my practice, my meditation practice. I uh, will we'll do this intensive practice up on this mountain. So I went up there, there's uh, a couple of Thai monks with me. We had the, there was an old uh, Cambodian jetty or stupa there from the Angkor Wat period. And it was quite a big, huge stone, kind of big square stones. And how they got all those stones up, I, nobody really knows how they built it. <coughs> it's quite nice. You're high up on this hill and these nice flowers and trees. And, Nobody, it was so far away that nobody, hardly anybody ever came to it. And in the morning we'd have to climb down this hill, very steep. It took us quite a long time. At dawn we'd leave and 
walking barefoot, we go down this all these rocky paths down to wait at the base of this hill. And there, by this reservoir, this little kind of tin roof uh, hut, and then there, some villagers would come with food. They put it in our bowls, and we climb back up to the top of this hill and eat the food. And the rest of the day, we just meditate. I put up my umbrella. I have this called Tudanga umbrella, made out of bamboo, kind of big umbrella, and you put a mosquito net around it and sit there during the day and practice uh, meditation. Well then, I, I was quite elated at first with this place. It was so peaceful, so beautiful, so quiet. Just what I'd always wanted. And so I'm going to spend the rest of my life here. I, so, I love it so much. So then, uh, after a couple of weeks of that, I didn't like it anymore. And I felt very annoyed by everything. One of the monks I began to hate intensely. <laughs> I became so obsessed with hatred for him, I, couldn't, you know, I just couldn't eat with him anymore. I had to go off and eat by myself. I just sit there and just get rid of this hatred. I came up here to have peace. This blasted monk is bothering my practice. <laughs> but he fortunately left and went away for long periods of time, and so when he was gone, the, uh, the hatred would cease. And when I could then find some, something else would start disturbing me. Then, one day, in the middle of the hot season, I really hot, I was coming back up the hill and I stubbed my toe on a rock quite severely. And, and uh, that evening, well, that evening I became very ill. Next morning I couldn't, I couldn't even stand up because my leg was terribly infected. There was no cut or anything on the toe, just, just the stubbing in the toe set something off inside and I couldn't walk. It was a terrible fever. So the other monk, little, tiny little monk, Thai monk, rushed down to the bottom of the hill and brought up the villagers and they carried me down the mountain. And there I lay in this little tin hut in the hot sun, in a terrible fever, and they had to bring in some kind of local uh, medic, I mean, they riding on a horse, it was so out of the way that he was, he, he traveled around by horse, and he would give me penicillin shots. And then the villagers uh, lived quite far away, but they'd prepare food, but they didn't they were, even though they were very kind, the kind of food they prepared I couldn't eat. And there was no tea, no coffee, no fruit juice, no ice, nothing but kind of ditch water, uh, coarse food, and this, and I couldn't walk, I had to lay under this tin roof the hot season, and day after day for about three weeks, in this kind of miserable state, and all dirty, stinking, uh, rash on my my skin, and these little little tiny little gnats and flies crawl in your eyes all day long, in your ears, up your nose. Just, every time you open your eyes, they hover, go for, fly right in. Sometimes they fly in your ears, and they go right down inside. <laughs> And I was laying there and thinking, I came here to meditate, and now I'm ruining, ruining my practice. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody to talk to. You'd hear the planes, the airplanes flying overhead. And this friend of mine, who was in the Peace Corps with me, was working up in Vientiane, with making about $800 a 
month teaching English. We had a very nice place to live and lived a quite interesting, active social life. And Vyang Chan on $800 a month was you could live like Maharaja in those days. And I thought, what am I doing here? I could be up in Vyang Chan making $800 a month because I had better qualifications than he did. <laughs> I listened to the airplane flight. I could, I could go home, go back to California, and uh, thought about my mother. If she needed my mother again, because she would take better care of me. And I began to really feel sorry for myself. You know, this kind of dreary hopelessness of being in the most impossible situation where you might even die. And you couldn't talk to anybody, and the f- couldn't eat the food. There was nothing pleasant, nothing. There's no relief from the pain or the heat or the annoying things around you. There was no even, you know, there was nothing. Uh, no pleasant tea in the afternoon. Sometimes the monk would boil hot water, and you just drink plain old boiled water, kind of a treat. <laughs> and so for a few days I lay there just feeling really depressed and felt sorry for myself and complaining and then I then I realized what well, I kept I, but I started reflecting on what was happening so then I decided that I would meditate on it so I started practicing meditation. I started doing anapanasati. I tried to sit up for a while, and just keep a straight posture in the heat, and just be at peace with the heat and the and the gnats and the flies, and develop the, a firm mind, not just get carried away by my feelings and the annoyance and the pain and uh, unpleasantness of the present. And in a, within a couple of days, I, my, my, I was really peaceful. There's nothing else to do. There's nothing to read, nobody to talk to, nothing to do. And I was kind of at a dead end. There was no place to go, no way to get out of it, except through mental, through meditation. And after that, I didn't mind anymore. I, quite, I was very peaceful. I'd sit there and felt quite a lot of metta for the flies and began to be cheerful to the monk when the villagers would come try to entertain me a bit I began to feel quite happy just through letting go of the habitual tendencies of the mind to be discontent and averse to the conditions because they're not what you want then the foot eventually healed and I went back up to stay on top of the mountain again. Now, I learned a, a very important lesson from that because I, I really learned that what I had to do was just to do one thing, I had to develop effort when my mind went into negativity like self-pity and, and uh, depression I had to put forth effort, I had to rouse the mind doing something like anapanasati, doing, uh, doing something positive rather than just laying there in a kind of misery and indulging in misery. And then I resigned myself to being there. I didn't, didn't allow myself to think of leaving or, or changing, complaining about anything. I just gave up to the moment, to the situation and was at peace with it. And in that condition, I began to find joy and peacefulness. Now that's when things are going very badly for you. There wasn't anything there, you know, on the, that was that one could say uh, was uh, that I felt at that time was positive. I mean, the villagers were nice, doing the best they can, but I wasn't all that grateful. I was. Complaining about the food, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of self-pity and fear. 
But that effort to of training the mind, like just doing something mentally, even when you're crippled and can't move, you can the mind you can still you can still concentrate the mind on the breath. Or development of metta, of being at peace with the with the discomfort, the pain, the annoyance. But you have to do it in a constant way. You can't just start and then fail and start feeling sorry for yourself. You have to do it like one inhalation, being constant, and one exhalation, developing a so that they connect. You know, so that you have a you have a, a things connect one thing to the next, rather than doing it and then getting lost in this. Develop a just say a one mindful inhalation first. Make the Make everything so that it's simple, and you can do one thing at a time rather than just trying to meditate to get rid of the annoyance. Become like a perfectionist, almost one who's very fussy about just the beginning of the inhalation, even to the middle, <laughs> so that you are rousing that kind of in scrutiny and intensity in your mind to to watch this breath, this cycle of the breath, the inhalation, exhalation. <coughs> or with the metta practice, just use the, the metta practice. Just as a way of a concept of metta, friendliness, kindness, peacefulness with an unpleasant <coughs> condition. Just keep reminding yourself that it's all right, be at peace with it. Uh, in, in that kind of way of just allowing things to be as they are and then using the, the like the Anapanasati or mantra to arouse put forth that kind of concentrated effort so sometimes the most miserable situations are the best teachers it's that this blasted foot is ruining my meditation. Seemed like it, didn't it? This foot ruined my meditation many times. When I'm, several years later, I went out to stay on an island in the Gulf of Thailand. Because I did five, five years with Ajahn Chan. After five years, uh, according to the Vinaya, you can leave your teacher with his permission and kind of go off by yourself. So this was a great moment. I'm, I thought, I'm going to go off by myself and practice. So I went to uh, Bangkok because of, I had to get a new passport. And then I wrote to Ajahn Chah and says, I'm, I've had five... I didn't dare ask him in person because I was afraid he'd say no. So I, I've had five years with you now, and I'd like to spend the spend the uh, rainy season retreat on this island called Sichang, because Westerners were beginning to come to Wat Ba Pong, and I wanted to get out of teaching. I didn't want to. I, I wanted. I still had this idea. I wanted to practice meditation uh, like a hermit. I have a, uh, uh, I had this kind of obsession with hermetic practice. So I went out to this island. It was ideal. It was just superb. It was a lovely island right out in the Gulf. And you, uh, you could, and they had a village there where the people gave vegetarian food of all. There was a monk, a hermit monk living there, Ajahn Arun, and he he was a, a vegetarian, so he arranged so that you'd get vegetarian food. And a fishing village of all places. Then, it had little huts and caves and things, so Ajahn Arun took me several days, we walked all over the island, and he found this wonderful spot. A little bamboo hut on a cliff, looking over the sea. Ideally. And then you walk down from the hut, a path, and there was this cave with a beautiful meditation path built right into the cave so that you could walk during the rain 
And then a chamber inside the cave, it was completely black. You could do sensory deprivation. You could just sit in this black chamber without hearing or seeing anything. This is, this is perfect. It's just what I want. I'll be able to do all this samatha practice and get, develop all these jhanas. And then you go up to the top and you get tired of the cave. You walk right up to the top and sit in this lovely little hut look over the sea and you can and I like to concentrate on water you're just looking at the sea is very tranquilizing listening to the sound of the waves on the shore and then you could on the morning you'd go on the arms round not very far you didn't have to walk very far to this village people were very nice they didn't ever bother you they knew you were a hermetic monk so they, they never came to see you but they gave you the food you needed ideal I was really enthusiastic about this. And then my foot became infected again. (laughs) So, I had to cross over to the mainland, go to the hospital, and there I was in the hospital for 20 days. And the foot huge, like a big elephant's foot, all red with cellulitis. In this wretched hospital where the monks sitting in this and laying in these beds were reading sex magazines and had (laughs) 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 I was disgusted (laughs) I was stuck in a ward full of Buddhist monks who were reading these magazines. <laughs> and then, here yeah, I was, he had this ideal setup on the island. I, you know, I won't be able to go there now. But I wasn't because uh, it was getting near to the wasa or the rainy season retreat. And I obviously couldn't, would not, would not be able to take care of myself. And there's a very kind monk that lived near there and had a forest monastery and he invited me to spend the vase at his monastery which I didn't really want to do but but he but it was the only practical thing to do so I spent the vase at this other monastery that I didn't want to go to I had to give up my dream of spending this vase on the island and then uh, nursing a painful and ugly foot for most of that time thinking this is interfering with my practice but during that vasa I learned uh, I had tremendous insight I had to give up a lot of my ideas and my desires and uh, then following that I went to India after that vasa and I, I told you about that experience. The foot was started up in India again. But by the time I finished with India, I had realized that I would no longer try to to uh, arrange things. I'd learned the lesson. And I had this sense of gratitude uh, that arose, in which I felt somehow that I had uh, needed to repay a debt like, for all the kind of support that had been given to me by people and the teaching by Ajahn Chah. So I decided to, since my visa was running out, that I should go back to Wat Bapong, where there were many Westerners uh, who needed an interpreter, a translator, and help Ajahn Chah in that way. So I went back. That that time I decided I know I would no longer live my life on my own terms, and I should just let life live itself and be mindful of it. And from that time on, I found meditation no problem. I was no longer thinking this is ruining my meditation. Things just are meditation, whatever they are, and. Uh, 
since then I have hardly had any time to to live quietly aloof in hermetic environments but it's not necessary if you don't if you have no opinions or views living in uh, uh, six years ago we started this international monastery called Nana Cha. There was a lot of resistance to that. I didn't really want to do that either. So get myself in having to teach and receive people and run a monastery and I'd never done it before and have to start building things, administration, all these things that I didn't like, didn't want to be bothered with. And I heard this mind carrying on, you know. I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. <laughs> it's interfering with my meditation. <laughs> I, I, knew that, I knew that one by now. I knew that silly thing that was always saying, it's interfering with my meditation. <laughs> I just did it, you know, just did what needed to be done. And this is, and this, this carried me on to England, and so forth. But that's how, and I say, life is no longer a problem, because one does what needs to be done and doesn't do what doesn't need to be done. Very simple. The form, I still remain within the form of the bhikkhu. And that's the container. I use that as a form for, for a containing form. It's the candle, the holder of the light. Because it's a beautiful form and useful and, and one knows how to use this particular form. The rest of it is just uh, once you've once you've learned the, how to use the form, then the rest of it's just uh, being aware that whatever rises passes away. No matter if it's fast or slow, if it's fast walking or slow walking, intensive practice or unintensive practice, whether it's America, England, or Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka, Tibet, China, whatever, whether you're with lay people or with monks or full of being praised and, and uh, adored or being criticized, jeered and laughed at, it's all just the same, isn't it? Anything that arises passes away. Adaptations come quite spontaneously and things go on and you find yourself quite able to cope with anything that, uh, you, that uh, arises and passes away. Now people have questions about all these different forms, you know, like people like Krishnamurti. His religion's a waste of time, it spoils spontaneity and condemns monks and things like that. And there's the Mahayana with the Bodhisattva ideal. And the different types of Buddhist practice There's the idea that it's better to do it as a layman than as a monk, and there's the idea that it's better to do it as a monk than a layman. But what can we know for sure about all these things without believing, taking pref, making preferences? This is that all these opinions arise and they pass away. That's what you can know for sure, whether monastic life is a waste of time or not, Krishnamurti says it's, um, not, it's useless. Don't believe Krishnamurti. But don't believe me either. <laughs> Just watch the belief and disbelief. 
be with what he can know that whatever arises passes away now this isn't an annihilation of belief but a seen belief is belief seen a spade is a spade seen things as they are rather than through the conditioned perceptions of doubt and attachment and aversion it's not up it's not up to you or to me to decide about who's right and who isn't you know is Krishnamurti right and the Buddha isn't right or is the Buddha right is Krishnamurti wrong is, is the Mahayana better than the Theravada or is the Theravada better than the Mahayana did I do intensive practice or unintensive practice did I ordain or not did I do this or that endless uh, things we have to make decisions on and come and form opinions about but what can you really know about any of these is that whatever arises will pass away one time in in uh, I was in Bangkok and I I uh, talking to some Christians or some, something was going on and I try to be as you know, with Christianity trying to be very tolerant and understanding of it <laughs> so then I after that I thought what do you really think do you think you know if somebody said, what do you really think? Do you think Buddhism is better than Christianity? What would you say? Or is Christianity better than Buddhism? And uh, what would you really, what do you really think? Or just, are you just trying to be polite and tolerant? I asked myself this question and I said, well, of course, I think Buddhism is better. That's why I'm a Buddhist. And then I, and I thought, yeah, but that's another, just an opinion, isn't it? That's just a view. That it's not. And then I suddenly uh, realized I didn't have to decide. It wasn't up to me to make decisions of that nature. To have to pass judgment on things and rate things according to what I think. And say this is the way it really is. See, Buddhism is first. <laughs> I might think that. The thought is there, but that's a thought. It's not necessary that one that one believe one's own thought. But you know that those thoughts are just thought, and one didn't even have an opinion about whether what Christianity is. It's not up to me to decide. It's not not uh, I'm not God that has to decide who who get the front row seats when they go to heaven. <laughs> well, I thought, well, this is this is really nice to know this. I don't have to make the decisions and pass judgments and, and that among people and conditions of the world. I felt very humble and very easy then, very at peace, because one realized he didn't need to have an opinion about such things. Opinions come and go, still, but they're just opinion. And you know them as such, and you don't. You wouldn't fight to the death over them or argue about it, because you know the limitations and the nature of opinions, views, and you realize it's not up to you to to know everything and have an opinion about everything and pass judgment on yourself and others on Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism and so forth now it's very peaceful to know that that one can just be with a breath have met it for the present existing conditions and life is easy and that when life gets tough on the conventional level one can be at peace with with the misery one can be at peace with little gnats flying into your eyelids 
calling up into your ears. One can be at peace with big, fat, red, painful leg and with coarse food and with a hot tin roof. These things aren't really suffering. It's the aversion to them, wanting life to be other than it is, that's the suffering. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations where there's just nothing. We have to just endure through that, what seemingly is unendurable. But when you know how to endure through the unendurable, then you find out that you can be as peaceful and as uh, and at ease even in the most miserable conditions if your if your mind is right. Now this is a great freedom, isn't it? Suddenly you're not you know there's nothing to fear anymore. You don't have to spend your life just trying to protect yourself, make sure that you have enough money so that you can have all the things you think you have to have in order to be happy. Because when that happens then there's never quite enough because greed knows no limits. Like if I just had enough money in the bank to make sure that for the rest of my life I would have be able to pay the rent, have enough food to eat, pay my medical insurance, pay the insurance on the car, and also allow for the inflationary rise of uh, gasoline, and make sure that I had at least able to take every other year vacation in in the Bahamas, and then just I'm not asking for very much, just enough money for <laughs> at least once a week I could eat in a good restaurant. I don't really want to be a millionaire but I want to have enough money to satisfy all my desires for the rest of my life. (laughs) What do you call that? I don't really want to become rich or a millionaire, but... (laughs) Now this is... See that the the uh, advantage of the Buddhist uh, reflection here on the four requisites. Suddenly, you think don't really want much of anything. One meal a day, some old robes, make do with any old shelter offered. The lowest standard of medicine you wouldn't believe. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, <laughs> but you can live on very little. Don't need very much. When your when your standard is like that, then you know you'll be able to get by no matter what happens. So in this sermon this evening, this talk, remember this that. There's nothing to fear, that you're not a mortal being. All you have to do is keep reminding, every time you think you are a mortal being, you start believing in this and that, opinions, views, worries, anticipation, dread and fear, that it's impermanent and not self, seeing that all that arises passes away, and just keep that constant, uh, constant reflecting on it, Keep aware that when when you're suffering, observe that you're suffering, that there's suffering there, and find out, you know, you're atta- obviously attached to something. You're frightened, or you're you're repressing something, or whatever. Bring it up. Look at it. See the attach. See attachment as attachment. And then let go. Let it go. Relax. Being at ease within yourself being at ease uh, with this body and the conditions of the mind that arise and pass away. Listen attentively to the mind. Listen to the silence. See if you can hear the silence this evening. Can you hear the silence of the mind? Rather than listening to all the chatter. Just intently listen. Turn the organ of the ear inward and listen to the silence of it. And
Satsang with Mooji 